not being strangers and keeping vision in our hearts. This week on the show, I talk with Arlie Russell Hochschild about making friends with Trump voters and Adam Hochschild on fighting fascism in 30s Spain. All that and we hear from an African-American couple we met in Cleveland at the RNC about why they were supporting Donald Trump. And I have a few words about press freedom and threats to it. The only thing worse than war between the White House and journalists, I suggest, would be peace. That's all ahead. Welcome to The Laura Flanders Show. What would you do to fight fascism? And do you think the Trump voters pose a fascist threat? This week, I'm happy to welcome to the show two writers who are well-placed to help us think about these questions. They are sociologist Arlie Russell Hochschild and historian Adam Hochschild, a husband and wife team. Adam's most recent book is Spain in Our Hearts, A History of the Spanish Civil War through the eyes of about a dozen Americans who fought in it. He's the co-founder of Mother Jones magazine and the author of, among other books, King Leopold's Ghost and To End All Wars. Arlie is the author of the National Book Award nominated Strangers in Their Own Land, Anger and Mourning on the American Right. Her other books include The Outsourced Self, Intimate Life in Market Times, The Unexpected Community, and many more. I welcome you both back to the program, in both of your cases, I think. Um, this is a fairly extraordinary moment. Um, and the two of you in your work capture so much of what we need to be thinking about today that it's a great honor to have you both sitting together with mm -hmm. us for a little bit. Let's start with your book, Strangers in Their Own Land. Just briefly, Arlie, your mission I think it was, what, five years ago you yes. set out on a journey to leave Berkeley and make some new friends? Yes, already you could see the growth of a right. Five years ago, uh, Congress was at deadlock and, and the left was kind of turning in on itself. And so uh, the thought occurred to me, why don't I get out of my enclave, since we're all in these enclaves, geographic, media, uh, electronic and go as far away as I can to to some things as right as Berkeley is left and see where I land and see what I find take my uh, political and moral alarm system off and try and cross an empathy wall to really get down and know people and see if I can understand kind of what their hearts are like and uh, why it is they we have the print found differences we do. And what'd you find? Well, you know, I started with the red state paradox, which is why all these poor states, you know, who have so many needs and uh, worse education and health and so on, take more money from the federal government than they give and hate the federal government. The first thing that I found was that that paradox didn't matter to them. Mm -hmm. They knew about it. They were ashamed about it. They knew we were fixed upon it. Um, and Louisiana, after all, was uh, in 2014 the poorest state. 44% of its uh, state uh, budget came from the federal government. And they were super Tea Party and now very enthusiastic Trump. So I thought, this is perfect. This is just where I need to be. This is what I don't get. And that, so I understood that at first they, uh, that wasn't their, their problem. Uh, they had something else that was more important to them. So your mission proved to be prescient in the extreme. I wouldn't have known just how prescient it was to study the Spanish Civil War in 2016. Mm -hmm. But as I read your book, I got lots of reasons why. What were yours? Well, I wish I could say that I foresaw this political moment that we're in right now. I didn't. Uh, I was uh, looking for a subject that I cared about. I'd long been fascinated by the Spanish Civil War. Uh, and I think that fascination began because I knew half a dozen of the American volunteers who fought in it. Uh, two of them were colleagues of mine on uh, one of my first jobs working for a newspaper in the 1960s. Uh, 
men 30, 40 years older than me, but when times were slow in the newspaper city room at the San Francisco Chronicle, I used to ask them about their San Francisco, about their Spanish Civil War experiences. And really only after writing about it did I begin to recognize as I finished the book, you know, as the Trump campaign was getting going, all of the similarities between the 1930s and today. Like what? Well, in the 1930s, we saw rise to power a lot of demagogues, uh, Hitler, Mussolini, Mussolini was already in power since the 20s, Franco in Spain, and a lot of lesser and less known imitators of theirs in Central and Eastern Europe, most of which was under re regimes of the extreme right. And I think there's something that all of these folks have in common which is that they tend to rise to power at a time when there's a lot of economic distress. In the 1930s, it was the terrible toll of the Great Depression. Today, we know that you know, the bottom 50 or 60 percent of the American population have since the 1970s been seeing real wages corrected for inflation decline. Jobs are less and less secure. So one thing that happens in a time like this is the demagogues come to power with certain messages in common, and you know, I'm talking about the 1930s, but see how much of it echoes today. One is, place your trust in me, a strong man. Don't worry about the details, I'll fix it right. when I get to power. Uh, another is to blame everything on some outgroup. You know, in the 1930s, it was most famously the Jews who were the fault of, you know, the cause of everybody's ills. Today, it's Mexicans, Muslims, Syrian refugees, immigrants to Europe, whatever. A third thing, I think, is to base your appeal, if you're going to school in demagoguery, mm -hmm. so to speak, to base your appeal on evoking the glories of your nation in the past. And I think there's one more similarity between the 1930s and today, which is that for all of these demagogues, one appeal of the great yesterday, so to speak, is that it was a time when women knew their place. They didn't run for president, uh, they were in the home, their role was to be wives, mothers, sexual objects, and that was it. They were not uppity, they didn't take jobs away from men. Women knew their place, and that is part of the glorious past that all of these demagogues consciously or unconsciously evoke. So women and people of color in the U.S. context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All of that makes perfect sense, mm -hmm. but you found something else as well. Not just an economic self-interest or an appeal to an economic self-interest, but something that at the end of your book you talk about emotional self-interest. What's the difference? Yes. And how does it relate? It's uh, an extension of economic self-interest. I came to realize that the way to understand the right feelings was through a deep story, which is a story that feels true. It, you take the facts out of it, you take the moral judgments out of it, it's just what it feels like, their deep story, and I think it's one that perhaps was evoked back in the 30s too. Uh, you're in a pilgrimage almost, you're uh, in a line waiting up a hill to receive the American dream mm -hmm. at the top, and you've been waiting a long time, you know, your feet are tired, you feel like you deserve this thing, line isn't moving, and then you see some people cutting in head. That makes you mad, what, cutting ahead, who are they? Well, they are blacks who now have access to jobs that used to be available only to whites. They are women uh, who now have access to jobs that used to be uh, available only to men. They are refugees. They are uh, uh, immigrants. They are even animals that are uh, now endangered by environmental pollution. You know, people would say, now the liberals are putting animals ahead of us. We're waiting in line, all these mm -hmm. line cutters. And now the federal government is an instrument of our marginalization, mm -hmm. our pride, our way of life, um, our honor. And then something snaps. I am a stranger in my own land. This isn't my parade. This isn't my land. And then Donald Trump comes along and gives them their land back, they feel. And their land in the form not just of 
land, but of license, of authority. You describe the effect, the emotional high yeah. of the kind of all bets off attitude to political correctness and That's the language right. of the Trump rallies. We can see the anger, but we can't see the mourning. And Donald Trump came around as an antidepressant. How so? Well, they were down. They felt like losers. They felt like uh, they, they were a minority group, they, they felt, uh, being erased and uh, sad about that and nowhere to go. And he came in a charismatic character. I am your voice and I will be your solution. And he was offering them almost a magical secular rapture rise to the top of the hill. Mm. There are winners and losers. There are also a lot of aspirers in both of these stories, and yours in particular. I mean, even the title, Spain in Our Hearts, um, the Camus quote, I think, mm -hmm. um, refers to that sense of a dream. Mm -hmm. And you have one wonderful character in your book, Lois, Lois Orr, 19-year-old mm -hmm. who finds herself in Bo, goes to Barcelona to, to look at not just the battles, but the social revolution that's happening. Mm -hmm. And I want you to talk more about that. There was a vision. They held a vision of a new world in their hearts, somebody else said. Um, do, how important was that vision? What was that vision of? What reinforced that vision? And then, of course, our question, my question mm -hmm. to you is, where is our vision today? Yeah. Yeah. Spain, remember, was a monarchy up until 1931. In the 1920s, it had been mixed with a period of military dictatorship. And only in 1931 did it really join the family of democratic nations. Then this group of extremely right-wing generals rose up in revolt against the elected government with a huge supply of arms, military advisors, and so forth from Hitler and Mussolini. Uh, the the vision that you're speaking of, I think, was most extreme in Spain's northeast, where the forces that in the first days defeated the military revolt, uh, the nationalists hoped to seize the whole country uh, almost overnight, but they only seized about a third of the country. They were turned back in the northeast, uh, Barcelona, surrounding Catalonia, the neighboring region of Aragon, uh, not by loyal troops, because there were very few of those who stayed loyal to the Republican government, but by worker militias put together by left-wing political parties and trade unions. And these militias, which often included women, uh, suddenly found themselves in control of a huge swath of the Spanish Republic. And over a period of about six or eight months, they put into effect the most far-reaching social revolution Western Europe has ever seen. Uh, workers took over factories, uh, the uh, Ford and General Motors plants in Barcelona were taken over by their workers who then immediately turned them into manufacturing armored cars that were needed for the front. Uh, railway drivers, engine drivers took over the railway system, trolley car drivers took over the urban transit, and for a few months, you know, barter really took over and peasants came in from the countryside and traded food for manufactured goods and, and so on. Um, it was a remarkable moment. That social vision, what is it amongst the strangers in their own land that you report on? And, and, yes. and are there places where their vision could connect with, with what you say is your vision, which is, the, yeah. which is a vision you, you paint of public space, really? Yes, that's right. They, um, their vision does involve the past and valuing family, church, uh, Actually, the world without government. All kind of <laughs> collective institutions, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Yes, and at the same time, much of their life is collective. I mean, that's, of course, the paradox. They're always doing for others, a little a honey hive there. Each church uh, is almost like uh, a government-like services involved. Uh, so they're ideal is to be free of uh, international control, uh, to be national, to all salute the American flag, to have uh, native-born people within the United States and a flourishing economy for them, finally. They won't be, uh, you know, the, 
the people forgotten in the back of the line, they will be at the front of the line themselves. So I think that's their vision. So how could it connect with our vision on the progressive side? I actually found a number of ways that there could be a crossover. Uh, out fishing with one man, super Trump, super Tea Party man. And I asked him, well, what do you think about Bernie Sanders? Oh, Uncle Bernie, he says, friendly feeling toward me. Well, not him, uh, Hillary uh, Clinton. She represented the latest one cutting in line and pushing him back. And he saw no future for himself in that vision. Sanders, yes, he, he had some things. Well, he's got his pie in the sky. He's too, he's too idealistic. You can't pay for all children's higher education. But he saw some appeal in that vision. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, putting brakes on Wall Street, he saw appeal in that. Mm -hmm. All the positions that you just mentioned were Bernie Sanders' positions. Mm -hmm. They're also Keith Ellison's positions, mm -hmm. whose mm -hmm. name is being put mm -hmm. forward as a possible chair of the Democratic National Committee. Mm -hmm. Keith Ellison, African-American, first Muslim elected to the House. Would he appeal? Mm, probably not. So talk about did, that. Yeah, Could you have done hear. this book as a black woman? No. No. Uh, definitely not. They were already afraid to talk about race, even even me being white. Oh, I know you think we're racist. I heard that a lot. Um, and race is uh, underlying this whole thing, as, as is women. I mean, these are, we're, we're the line cutters, and uh, they, they feel pushed back. They feel it's uh, zero sum. The whole concept of diversity as an ideal isn't part of their vision. But it does sound as if that emotional self interest is attached to whiteness. And how do we move beyond that in that this is not a white country no. and it's not going to be a white country? No. In the churches I attended, the Pentecostal churches around uh, Lake Charles uh, and Baptist churches, there might have been 15 or 20 percent black uh, parishioners and uh, some had adopted black children, and this wasn't an alien thing. It was already diverse, but uh, um, how to carry that into an ideal of diversity is the, the challenge. To close, you two have been together for half a century, doing the work that you do. Any advice for us all as we pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off, and look at yet more long haul? Well, I do think we have to keep imagining a better world. Yeah. There are moments, and right now in the United States is such a moment where it suddenly feels much farther off. But we still have to keep imagining it, and we still have to keep uh, looking for places where we can achieve some of these things, even if it's on a more state or local level. Mm -hmm. As we're talking right now, for example, there is going on in Morocco a follow-up conference uh, to the Paris Climate Accords last year, and I'm sure everybody there is in despair with the election of Trump. But our son is in Morocco at this conference in the California delegation, which has now assumed a certain importance because California's energy policy is going to diverge from the United States even more than it has already. You can do all sorts of things on a state and local level, and there are places where progressives do control state and local governments, yeah. and that's one place we have to look at the same time as we keep portraying what this kind of vision would look nationally. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we uh, have to uh, reach out across uh, the chasm that's uh, opened up in our country and be surprised by some possibilities that we, we didn't see uh, there uh, before. For example, uh, one, uh, one woman that I met, it was very Tea Party, her son was for Bernie Sanders, mm -hmm. and they were trying to work it out. 
uh, to see um, what kinds of uh, ag things, agreements they could find. A lot of uh, uh, that was going on. And they, they're good angels as well as bad angels. Uh, you don't see them, but they are there. And many people on uh, the Trump side actually are as disturbed by this rupture as we are. And uh, so eager for some healing. There's so many things we need to change oh, yeah. to bring this country together. But I thank you so much for making the journeys that you've each made mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. and individually and, and for doing the extraordinary work you both do. You. We'll have more coming up. Stay tuned. Lots of people have deep stories. We heard another couple's in Cleveland outside the Republican National Convention. Donna Jackson, a hotel manager working for Trump in Virginia, had a deep story having to do with President Obama letting her down. Take a look. The only thing that black America has asked uh, Barack Obama to do is be black in the presidency. For the LBG community, he, he passed three bills. For the Latino community, he, he passed an executive order and he put a, a Supreme Court justice on the bench. For the black community, zero executive orders. Zero legislation was introduced into the House or the Senate. So nothing. In fact, here's, here you have um, black American youth with a 59% unemployment rate. How do you have that with a black president. So I like Trump because he is a straight shooter. You know, too many times you go into, say, for example, your job, and I've had this experience myself, where you're, when my manager has said, Donna, you're perfect, you're ready for the next level, go ahead and post for this job. And then when I go, behind my back they go, she's not ready. Trump is a straight shooter. He's going to tell you yes or no. I would prefer somebody to be truthful, irregardless of how difficult that is to take, than somebody sit there and egg me on, say like a Barack Obama who said, you know, I feel compassion because your um, black men are getting shot by these police officers, right? When he knows that they have the Department of Justice, the Office of Civil Rights who found, and the Attorney General who found nothing that these police officers did wrong, yeah. because if they did, he would have. They would have filed some kind of suit against those police officers. So on the one side, he's pandering and saying, "Yeah, I emphasize with you," when he knows that they legally did not do anything wrong. For more of our Republican National Convention coverage, check out the archives at our website, LauraFlanders.com. I'm not like other people. We're going to have people sue you like you never got sued before. With words like those uttered in February this year, Donald Trump set fear into the heart of the fourth estate. We're in for the fight of our lives over press freedom, said the president of the Freedom of the Press Foundation the day after Election Day. The threats are very real. On the campaign, Trump belittled, bullied, and blacklisted reporters he didn't like. From the stage, the candidate egged on his crowd to hiss the press corps and a long list of untrustworthy reporters were famously barred from the scene. Not satisfied with blacklists and bully tactics, Trump threatened lawsuits. It's pretty clear he hasn't the slightest grasp of the Constitution, which, come January 20th next year, he'll be pledging to uphold. It's real. Donald Trump's disdain for the First Amendment spurts from his lips, his eyes, his everywhere. Still, while others fundraise off rumors of a press White House war, I say, bring it on. We need relations between the press and the powerful to be as cantankerous as possible. It's media coziness with power that brought us to this place. The Washington Post and the New York Times were suppressing pictures of dead and tortured Iraqis and holding back stories about illegal state spying long before Donald Trump came to power. More frightening to me than a new chill in press presidential relations was the picture of Trump's Secretary of State contender, Rudolph Giuliani, nattering with Rupert Murdoch of News Corp recently. 
to get real. Lawsuits cost money. If media corporations are to fight for their rights and defend their reportings, they're going to need real cash. So it is great that readers are stepping up to the plate, signing up in droves for new subscriptions to The Times, The Post, and magazines. The New Yorker says it signed up 10,000 new subscribers in a matter of hours. Sign up, subscribe. We need you more than ever. But put your money where the courage has been. Who has best had your back? The crony corporate press or the independent media who've never held anything back and never had two pennies to rub together?